everyone. Welcome to Nova Southeastern University's South Florida Geriatric Work Enhancement Program podcast, also known as SF GWEP podcast. We are here to educate, encourage, enhance our knowledge and skills, and promote all those amazing health profession experts working with the elderly, including caregivers and interprofessional teams. My name is Dr. Desiree Simon. I am an advanced practice registered nurse and assistant professor at the Casey Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at NSU, as well as a clinical trainer. In today's podcast episode, we are taking an in-depth look at common foot myths, separating facts from fiction with our subject matter expert, Dr. Mark Jaffe. Dr. Jaffe earned his doctorate in podiatric medicine and surgery from the Illinois College of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery in Chicago, Illinois. He continued his postgraduate studies with a surgical residency at Doctors General Hospital in Plantation, Florida. To understand the complexities of the care delivery system, he subsequently earned a master's degree in Health Service Administration from FIU, Florida International University. His passion for sharing his knowledge began early in his career when he taught clinical skills to interns, residents, and nurses. He has practiced podiatric medicine in Broward County, Florida for over 30 years, specializing in diabetic foot care and preventative medicine. He remains a life member of the American Podiatric Medical Association, better known as APMA. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at NSU, Holmos College of Arts and Science. He's very passionate about experimental learning and mentoring the next generation of healthcare workers. So let's go right into it. Hello, Dr. Jaffe. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our SF GWEP podcast, and I wanted to thank you for your time and expertise. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Can we start by telling us why this topic is so important to you? Yes, but first I kind of want to mention Doctors General Hospital. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with it. It was the only hospital in Florida that allowed DO students, which is of course the main program here at NSU in the, in the graduate program, even though there's of course now programs in just about any healthcare discipline you can think of. But at that time, osteopathic physicians could often not get into a typical hospital. And so that was my first experience with DOs as a podiatric resident. And I was so impressed that I guess it led me here eventually to when I uh, retired from practice to teach here. Sadly, that hospital no longer is in existence. It's now, I believe, some kind of school. So it's still being used properly for education. And that's probably a sign of progress because DO students nowadays are so equal to MDs, they have no trouble getting just about any program they want. Awesome. So go ahead and tell us about why this topic is so very important to you. To me, I believe, you know, we're going to be talking about foot myths and the importance of foot care. And just like any other potential condition of the body, there is a lot of misinformation out there, unfortunately. And that information is spread through the Internet, social media, even on televised programs. So it's really incumbent upon healthcare workers to try to kind of clear the air, so to speak, and make sure that we are providing patients the most up-to-date and accurate information that is possible so they can make good, informed decisions. So, for example, in my own experience, diabetic patients will often try to do what we term bathroom surgery, which basically means they use improper cutting instruments. They usually, due to their condition, can't reach their feet, have poor circulation, poor vision, and so they will often maybe nip the tissue around, say, a toenail. And then they either ignore it or they're told by other, even healthcare workers, it'll go away. And unfortunately, it doesn't. Often, maybe too often, it can actually develop into what's called an ulcer, which is a non-healing wound. That can get infected. And ultimately, it is possible this person could lose their leg and even their life. Wow. 
That's really good to know because we see a lot of those patients in the clinic setting. So that's a really good thing that we're doing that. For the podcast audience, can you share what health professionals should know about this topic? Absolutely. So as a podiatrist, we are part of the healthcare team, along with every other discipline in healthcare you can think of. Physicians, nursing, optometry, dentistry, you know, we're not, we don't have the time to list every healthcare profession. And therefore, we have the training and the expertise and the knowledge to be a very valuable part of that team. For non-podiatrists who don't have the time to do the training that podiatrists like myself have done, it's still important that they can at least recognize some of the common foot issues that are out there and that I believe we'll be talking about in a few minutes so that they don't necessarily treat it, but that they can direct their patient to the best source, which could very well be a podiatrist. That's good to know. What are some of the common foot issues among the elderly? As I guess you could say, sadly, I'm now part of that crowd. I am now, as a baby boomer, have entered my seasoned years, so to speak. I am finding some of the issues that I was well aware my patients were having, such as reaching their feet, seeing their feet, or unfortunately, I am firsthand experiencing. In my anatomy classes at the master's and undergraduate level, I always kind of tell my students, be aware of living the anatomy and physiology, and I am starting to do that. However, it is important, as I said, that they have enough information, that they're good listeners, and they can direct the patient to the appropriate resource or person best suited to treat that condition. We could mention many different problems that unfortunately with age seem to get exacerbated or worsened. But I'll mention some that I have seen over decades of practice. Are you all familiar with a bunion? Yes. A bunion is basically a bony and soft tissue enlargement of the great toe joint. The base of the big toe, typically this joint just gets bigger and bigger and forms a knot-like structure. Sometimes if it's associated with an inflammatory condition, rheumatoid arthritis, it can by itself, even without shoe pressure, be extremely painful. But more typically, it's more of that wear and tear arthritis. It typically takes a period of time to develop and usually is mostly symptomatic in some type of closed shoe that's a little taut over it. And so the shoe pressure is what really makes it uncomfortable. It is more commonly seen in females and you could probably guess why. Why? The why is because of the shoes you wear. It's not too many gentlemen that tend to wear pointed high heel shoes usually. And therefore, the shoes are one aspect. But also, um, women, and often men as well, do have, you could say, the genetic predisposition to it. So it's the perfect storm. You're set up to do it, and then you wear the kinds of shoes that almost guarantee you're going to get it. How often would you recommend the elderly to check their feet? Every person should check their feet regularly. And for the elderly, if they are capable, meaning they have good corrected eyesight, maybe by optometrist or ophthalmologist, they should view their feet with simple technology. And this is something the OT, occupational therapy people can tell you, and other practitioners. There's lots of devices out there. There are scales with a glass-covered mirror, which I think is great. Now, we always don't want to see the weight, but sometimes monitoring your weight's important. But what I'm getting at is a safe mirror on the floor that you can actually see the bottom of your feet. Mm -hmm. Unless you're able, and I'm telling you for myself, who used to be more flexible, able to get that foot where you can turn it so that you can see the sole of your foot, you're missing some of the most important areas, as well as between the toes. This should be done daily, usually like after the shower is a good time. Mm -hmm. You want to dry between your toes. I know we'll be getting to some good foot care ideas, but that's something everyone should be doing, especially in moist, humid Florida. Okay. I'm not sure if we'll address this later, but I wanted to know, should, would you recommend like a, a sole to put inside your shoes or, you know, any type of different types of shoes that you can use in particular for the elderly? Well, you know, I think everything has to be not necessarily customized, but individualized. Okay. And that takes knowledge. Again, going back to our original thoughts, is going to the correct person. And often it will be a podiatrist. We spend four years in podiatric medical school. 
We also then typically nowadays have a two to three year surgical residency. So we are very competently trained to do this. In addition, there are subspecialties podiatrists are more and more getting into, such as sports medicine, not just surgery and general care. Others, it's specifically into diabetic care. So it really depends. I would say it's really a match. And the best way, what I'm talking about is you have to outline your foot. I don't know if you were ever a child and maybe at Thanksgiving they took your hand or your foot and they did an outline of it and then maybe you made a turkey out of it. But you really should do that for your foot. And if you don't want to use, say, paper and ink, what you can actually do is if you have, which we do in Florida, wet sand or just for pool, if you dip your foot in the tub or the pool and then go in some dry pavement or the tile, whatever's next to your bathtub, you will see the impression. And you'll get a general idea as whether you have a flat arch a narrow arch, a high arch, etc. Plus, have your shoes that you typically wear handy. And put the shoe on top of that kind of wet impression. If it's not, in other words, if the impression of wet or sand, what have you, is wider or longer than your shoe, then you have really a mismatch. You're trying to crowd a wide, long foot into a short, narrow shoe, and nothing good is going to come of that. As we're still talking about the elderly, I notice a lot of our patients, when they come into the clinic, they go to the nail spa, and they get their nails done, and they get it cut. Do you recommend that for them? Again, it, if the facility is following hygienic measures, why not? You know, as long as they don't have an underlying condition where they should be cautious, such as diabetes, poor circulation, maybe they're on some kind of medication that would affect their bleeding times or, God forbid, cancer. So excluding that population, I think that a reasonably healthy older person should be able to tolerate that. But again, I underscore proper hygiene. You are putting your trust specifically into what these people are providing you. So if they have, say, a Whirlpool bath, which is great, you know, it's very relaxing, the jets are great. However, if it's not cleaned and sterilized between people, then it's kind of just like anything. You're sharing whatever germs was on the previous patient or participant, you're now exposed to. Right. And so what we're really finding, and we, I didn't personally take part in this uh, study, but we did find there's a high risk of what's called fungal nails because the instrumentation in these salons are not often sterilized properly. And so some of the fungal spores from the previous person, as they're cutting your nails, unfortunately, it's just like planting a seed, yes. will grow on you. And so you are basically being contaminated with other people's infectious material. Wow. Wow, that's great to know. Thank you so much for that. The next question as we go back into, segue back into the next question, what are some of the more common questions asked by your patients? Why do I have foot numbness? And what about, why do I have cold feet? Actually the numbness, how much sensation they either have or don't have in the cold feet can actually be very kind of similar and often have to be differentiated from each other. So for example, as I mentioned, I specialize in diabetic foot care. And diabetics often, unfortunately, do have some significant foot problems. They may have what's called peripheral neuropathy, Correct. which basically means that they do not have the normal day-to-day -day sensation a person without diabetes wouldn't have. Now, it may run the gamut from they feel pins and needles, or sometimes they'll tell me like cactus burrs, like it's just constantly sharp pins all the way from their toes, say, up into their mid-calf. Kind of in a sense worse than that they're totally insensate and they are numb and i actually experienced that with a patient that early in my career i did a house call he lived off of dixie highway near the airport in fort lauderdale and at that time i was offering to do house calls for hospitals and stuff to follow up so this gentleman actually lived in a shack it's very interesting right there in dixie highway i believe it was probably not originally intended as, as a home but i found out he was diabetic. I was there just to do a follow-up, actually, for another doctor. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman often let me come inside. Basically, he took off. He was wearing, like, if you know what penny loafers are, yes. you know, non-tie shoes. But they were really old. I kind of saw on the bottom they were completely smoothed out. So one thing I immediately thought of is risk of falls. Okay. 
Number two, I then had him remove the shoes and I noticed his sock was wet. And fortunately, even in those days, I was a little bit of a germaphobe. I did have gloves on. I noticed it was wet and red. It was blood. So I was able to help him remove his stockings, and I noticed he had a gash under his foot. Looked at his shoes. Nothing, you know, except being worn out, there's nothing going on inside. I then asked him to get all his shoes after I dressed his foot, and he did, and he brought out like six more pairs. And I noticed one of them, again, worn out, and this time I almost got hurt. It had what looked like, if you know what a glass shard looks like. Yes. Big triangular piece of glass through and through the sole into where basically the ball oh. footers would be. And my fingers went like this. I didn't even notice it because I put my hand inside and it basically cradled it. So I was fortunate. I didn't end You're up with a, a problem my own. So that was really a wake-up call for me, one of many with diabetics. This person was totally insensate. He was unaware of it. He couldn't afford to take public transportation. He walked everywhere and he was unaware of it. Fortunately, he had good circulation, and with good medical care, he healed up. It's interesting that you did house calls. Yes, at one time I, I did do that, and I think it is one of the most important things people should do. And I don't mean to be crude, but it's kind of like, instead of seeing an animal in the zoo, see it in the wild. So instead of trying to treat a patient in your office, which is ideal for you, say, not necessarily for the patient, do it in their kind of comfort zone, if you can. I'm not saying that should be the only thing, but at some time in a career, I do highly recommend it. It's eye-opening, and I, and I think it uh, helps reach kind of an audience that is often neglected. Maybe they don't have transportation. I don't think I mentioned the coldness. So the coldness can be lack of circulation. That's a common cause. Again, people use words, and they don't always exactly mean what they say. So if I was to ask you, what does poor circulation mean to you? I would say where you can't feel um, you lost a sensation in the whichever extremities, you don't really feel it well, you feel some numbness, it's just not, it doesn't feel the same. Okay, so it's kind of, again, can be related to the numbness part, but often they'll say it's cold, it just looks purplish at some times. Now, this can be due to some type of circulatory problem. Now, that circulatory problem could be local, could be possibly due to blockage in the foot or the leg. But often it does relate to the entire body, which is really what I think makes the care of the feet so fascinating. Your feet don't walk in without the rest of you. Your feet attach this body to it. So as podiatrists, we have to take everything into account. So it could very well be your heart's the problem and your feet are just feeling the symptoms of it. So again, you really need a thorough kind of workup. There's special tests that need to be done because it can just be you're starting to just develop sensitivity to the cold or you have a problem that's kind of like a stick of dynamite, and if it's not addressed soon, you could have a serious problem. Are there any type of activities that you would recommend your patients take doing on a daily basis or three times a week just to improve the circulation to the extremities? I'm a walker. I think it is the best activity in the world because all you need is feet, hopefully socks and shoes, the appropriate shoes. That's it, and then some kind of place that is safe. You don't want to be walking in the middle of the street. And mentioning that, notice I did say shoes and socks. Do not walk barefoot, especially if you're getting older. Too many foreign objects out there, too much risk to you if you do get a cut. So true, so true. If someone were to come in and ask, why do I have itchy, flaky skin on my feet? What would, what would you say to them? Well, again, you're gonna ask more questions. It could be something as simple as they bathe too often or they're going in the pool too much, so their skin's drying out, and all they really need then is maybe some moisturizer afterwards. It could be a common condition called dermatitis, which I think you yourself are very familiar with and probably treat, uh, and there's many different forms of it. It could also be a sign of athlete's foot. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be an itchy problem. Sometimes it's just kind of a pinkish scaly problem. And the way you really can recognize it in the foot, it tends to be on the sole of the foot or between the toes. So I guess that's why I highly recommend um, to check between your toes after you shower or bath. Yeah, dry them and then don't cream them and definitely don't ointment them because they'll keep it too macerated, meaning your skin gets so wet it kind of causes the skin to chafe a little bit. Mm -hmm. But a, sometimes just a very mild lotion, and I mention a lotion because it's water-based, and just enough like a drop on the tip of a finger and make sure that it blends in and disappears. You should not see anything creamy and your skin should just be slightly moistened from its normal state. 
So if they were to ask you, if, you know, they go to Walgreens or CVS, which one would they pick up, like a Jurgens, a Eucerin, Cellophil, which one would you recommend? Again, based on a further, you know, the appropriate diagnosis, just general good care. I mean, pretty much any national brand. I'm not really comfortable with the, especially, and I apologize, dollar store brands. I'm not sure where they're made. Speaking of that, I do recommend people see where things are made. Make sure that hopefully it's made by a company and maybe even by a country that you can be a little bit more dependent on. I'm not naming names of who I wouldn't be. That's inappropriate. Just because it's cream or medicine in a bottle doesn't mean it's equivalent. Correct. If they think it's athlete's foot, and specifically if they've been diagnosed with that before, then something like a Gold Bond or any kind of brand name, Lotrimin, I'm just mentioning these. I have no affiliation, no affiliation with them. No affiliation with those Okay, companies. But anything that they can get without a prescription, if it's mild and they can self-treat it. If it's more than that, then they will be diagnosed by either a skin doctor, a regular doctor, or a foot doctor, and get the appropriate prescription drug. Oh, okay, thank you. What if they come in and they have a heel pain? Heel pain is not that uncommon. It's basically, it depends on the presentation. The most common presentation is sometimes, and patients talk to each other, by the way. Mm -hmm. Very seldom they come in and just say, my heel hurts. Usually they say, I talk to so-and-so in my condo or whatever, and that basically they think they have what they had. And it's sometimes called a heel spur. Or they had their foot x-rayed for whatever reason before, and the doctor noticed that there's a little bit of extra bone that would be called a spur. Well, that's kind of a misnomer. The pain of a heel spur is really not bony. It's actually a soft tissue structure called the plantar fascia. And the plantar fascia is basically a cord. It's kind of a fibrous ligament, if you think about that. And it has a very important role in maintaining your proper arch. Now, this cord attaches from under your heel mm -hmm. to the ball of your foot, of course, deep to the skin. And therefore, based on the mechanics, the way we walk, which is in a forward position, it pulls off the heel. And over time, that causes an inflammatory reaction. Initially, if you've ever heard of bursitis occurs, yes. then the fasciitis occurs. Over time, it can calcify. And that calcification on x-ray may look like a bone spur. So it doesn't really matter if the spurs there or not. Now the good news is that they don't typically need to be surgically removed. Most of the time, good, what you could say, conservative or regular care with appropriate shoes, physical therapy, or cortisone injections if necessary, or over-the-counter analgesics, anti-inflammatory drugs, taping, and you mentioned something before, art supports or orthotics are very important here, along with appropriate stretching. People don't think they need to stretch their feet. You do need to stretch your feet. Now, how do you go about stretching? What would be a way to do that? If the person is stable, meaning they're not at risk of falling, then you could just stand up in front of a wall mm -hmm. about two feet away, bring, like you, if you know what a push-up is, put your hands against the wall, your feet are about a foot back, and then just kind of bend one knee at a time as you go towards the wall. Don't bang into the wall. And that will start to stretch the heel cord. Your foot, like the kid's song, is connected to the ankle, to the knee, and so on. So you can't just treat what's in the foot. You have to understand that there's other structures that have a major influence on what goes on in the foot. You know, someone told me when I because I like to wear high heels. How do you recommend when you have plantar fascia? There's this exercise that someone had told me to put my bottle in the refrigerator as frozen and then roll it under my feet to help alleviate some of the pain when I wear heels at the end of the day. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. You're getting a strain from wearing the, the heels. That puts you in the same position a horse walks on, which is called Aquinas, which means horse. And so that typically, again, we mentioned that Ladies tend to have, often present with more foot problems per se than men. Men have their own unique foot problems, but in terms of bunions and heel problems, often it's the ladies a little bit more commonly than the gentlemen. What you mentioned is great. Yes, I will recommend that. It's basically a very low tech way of getting an ice, a better than an ice pack, because you're also getting rolling. The rolling is a massaging. So you're really getting two for one, two right? For one. right? Two therapies for one, it's great. Yeah, so I, I think for us who like to wear heels, whether it's the three inch or the two inch, whatever it might be. What are your recommendations on he wearing heels and how should we go about doing that? Because it's not good for our posture, it's not good for our feet. So what do you recommend when it comes to that? Well, often 
when the ladies, or if it's a gentleman, have been wearing heels for a while, they've actually adapted to that. So the first mistake a young professional might make is, say, going to flats. It's kind of like going from a height to the bottom without adjusting. And that can often mean that the person will not tolerate it because their heel is a little bit tighter. If they're not stretching, it's going to be very uncomfortable to go in a flat. You can work them down. So I'm not a big six inch heel. I say a little bit more reasonable. Two to three inches is, is to me a more reasonable height if you're going to have it. But really more important than that to me is do you have to wear them 24 seven? So often for the females that have a kind of an occupation and they feel that they do need to wear a dress up shoe and that can be a heel. I will say, can't you wear a sneaker driving there? You have to drive in heels really till you get to the office. And then when you're done with the day, do you have to walk out in heels? So that will help minimize some of the time. There are special high heel shoe inlays, orthotics, mm -hmm. believe it or not, podiatrists oh, okay. can make for you, which will help a little bit as well. And that, that's stretching. You gotta stretch definitely when you get home. Your ice massage, as you mentioned, excellent. And then do some stretching. Don't let your heel, basically in your foot, get that tight and start to form that shape. Wow, thank you so much. What about discolored nails? Discolored nails is very problematic for a lot of people, and it runs the gamut from just basically, sorry for myself, I'm apologizing, aging. Nails tend to become more opaque, kind of like cataracts in the eye over time, so a little yellowing is normal, but what we don't want to see is streaking. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see excessive thickening that goes along with it. That can become extremely difficult to self-trim or even to have your pedicurist, as you're mentioning, to do it. Often, they, I have seen nails as thick as an inch. I can't cut them. I literally have to use a grinder first. I have to grind them down, sadly enough, because there's no instrument that will tolerate it. I've tried it, again, when I was starting out, not thinking, and I broke my instruments on it. So I fortunately didn't hurt the patient, but I did have a problem with the instrumentation. So I learned the hard way, grind it, make it flat enough, then I can cut it for them. That, unfortunately, the worst would probably be fungus, what's known as onychomycosis or fungal nails. Very unsightly, very actually difficult to totally clear, regardless of what you see on TV ads or on small over-the-counter bottles and drugstores. Seldom can you get a beautiful nail from that. So be very careful with that. There is usually, it's an understanding that this is a chronic infection and it picked for itself, what you would say the best location, but for treatment, the worst location. Your feet are already the furthest from your heart of any body part you have. So they get the least amount of blood flow and therefore the least amount of good nutrients and to remove the waste products. So you're already a disadvantage when it comes to healing things. Now you put a very kind of tough organism and you probably picked it up at the gym because what do we say? Did you wear sandals when you were in that shower? No, we go barefoot. And so you went barefoot, somebody was shedding, in this case, that fungus. You were unlucky enough to have it maybe with the water on, on, the, on the shower floor get into under your nail, or you had a crack in your nail, and now you don't notice it right away. And that's the problem. It may take a year or more to actually develop. It will usually not steamroll you. It will be a gradual change, which in some ways is worse, because you won't be aware of it. You, you won't pay that much attention. And as we said earlier today, how many people look at their feet on a regular basis? Wow. Do you recommend then, because you know they have the pools, the communal pools, and do you recommend when the, especially the elderly, when they go to the pools, do you recommend them wearing those shoes that you can, it's almost like a glove. Is that better versus bare feet going into the pools? While it's not 100% protective, a water shoe will definitely protect you from slipping, from scraping, and definitely almost like my mask and possibly maybe picking up something fairly large to get into your foot. I have stopped going to my community's pool because I found Band-Aids in it, the pens, you know, you know, parts. It's just, to me, it's a little bit, sorry, gross. And I've gotten more and more kind of, I've always been health conscious that much more as I've gotten a little bit older. So if I were to go in it, yeah, absolutely. I would minimally have sandals with me outside the pool and I'd wear those water shoes in it. Great information. Now, the next question goes on to say, how do you prevent most of the common foot issues? You probably have already said it, but just to reiterate. Okay, so number one is to get the correct information and start forming good habits, just like you would for your, for your feet, just like you do maybe for your mouth, right? You hopefully brush your teeth regularly, floss, etc. So you should do the same for your foot. So you inspect it, 
something we teach our residents and nurses to do, you expect a body part, the patient should be their own doctor. Look at it over carefully. We've mentioned some ways you can do that. Dry your toes properly and then use either some light powder or light lotion just to be hygienic. When it comes to the toenails, cut them straight across. Biggest mistake, people gouge out the corners. They actually, the majority of the time, ingrown toenails are basically self-induced. People create them by improper nail care and then wearing, say, improper shoes and socks. Anything that crowds the toes. Now what about those cuticles that sometimes you get? Do you, should you cut them off or push them back? Try not to manipulate those areas. Those cuticles are there for a reason. God wouldn't give them if they weren't there. Now, unfortunately, they become a cosmetic issue for people. They're not a health problem. Again, if you want to use a little bit of a gentle buff, which might be a little over-the-counter device, kind of sand it down, just smooth it out. Use a pushback is okay. Don't trim them out mm -hmm. because I've seen, again, micro abrasions occurring and now germs can get in. That's another way to get that fungus. Have to agree. Now, what about foot odors? Foot odors occur because people don't take care of their shoes any better than they do their feet. So often, I'll ask my patients to bring all their shoes if we have that time to a visit, and we'll check them out. And I do the sniff test, but I don't stick my nose in it. I just kind of whiff it towards me. And in that case, what we're looking for is: is there any odorants? Typically, it's that combination of the patient's sweat whatever kind of soil they have on their feet, and the insole. Sadly, I do believe that the quality of shoes, like many things, has deteriorated over the years. And the problem with that, actually, is that many of my seasoned patients, such as myself, come to me with shoes that, when I started practicing in my 20s, were older than me. Now they're not. But typically, when you have a shoe that age, it probably should have not been maintained in terms of wearing it anymore. Many shoes are not actually made out of leather or cotton anymore like they used to. They're synthetic, and therefore they hold odor and they hold germs in them. So the bottom line is you should sanitize your shoes. You should stick them in the sun to dry out and deodorize overnight. You should change your shoes every other day, say, especially if you've been sweating. Change your socks at least once a day. These are some fairly simple going back to basic care, and that way you can put off coming to someone like me. Wow. Now, do podiatrists take insurance or is it self-pay? We're, as I mentioned, physicians under the Medicare and Medicaid law, so we're treated just like any other physician would be, which means that the majority, if they qualify, will take your insurance, private or government. However, like many specialists, there is concierge podiatry starting, where, of course, you pay a fee and then you get into that provider within the same day and they may or may not then take your insurance. That said, always check with your insurance as well as that provider if they are, quote, in network because you don't want any surprises financially mm -hmm. afterwards. Now, do, do the insurance cover their orthotics, the insoles, do they, how, and how many can they have for the year? Is it one shoe per year? How is that if they wanted a, a particular shoe in particular? Depends on the insurance. Some major medicals that are kind of that gold kind of a plan, that platinum plan, will probably pay just about everything. But typically, Medicare in particular only allows one pair of shoes if you are a diabetic at risk. That's it. That's it. If you're not diabetic at risk, they're not going to pay for it. So it's a good point. As providers, we have to treat and bill for what's called medically necessary. That doesn't mean the patient doesn't have a need to come to a podiatrist. If you're basically healthy, God bless you, and have no diabetes, circulation problems, but you just can't reach your feet, that is unfortunately not covered typically by most insurance. Now an HMO might, health maintenance uh, organization, but not straight Medicare or straight Medicaid. They will not pay for preventative care of a non-risk person. Now, if they wanted an insole that's not covered, where can they get that? Again, that's a little tricky. In offices, just like optometrists, many podiatrists do sell a lot of okay. over-the-counter products that are usually of higher caliber because it's usually an arrangement with a better lab to make them than what you would buy out in the field. So again, there's plenty of over-the-counter. I'm sure many of your listeners will remember names. I'll just say it. No affiliation, Dr. Scholes. But I think it's important that it be fitted by a podiatrist or someone who's kind of knowledgeable about that. 
The fact that it's over the counter by itself means that you should be using it or that you know how to use it properly. Can podiatrists treat broken feet in the elderly and sprains in the elderly? Absolutely. Too often, whether you're young or old, especially if you think you have a broken, let's concentrate on something simple like a toe. Often, maybe in the middle of the night, you get up, I've done that, and you stub your toe, and then maybe it goes back into position. And it hurts, and you're kind of limping a little bit. And again, going back to that misinformation and what I like to call myths as well, uh, you don't treat a broken toe, often people think, but that's actually incorrect. It can lead to kind of a chronic painful condition. It could cause an older person to start to lose their balance. It can set up a chain of reactions that can actually be, you know, very unpleasant for them. Where if they had gone to a podiatrist, whether it was a simple sprain toe or even an ankle sprain or a simple fracture of a toe or even a other part of the foot, it could have been addressed properly in the right amount of time. Do you think that the broken feet and sprains in the elderly, do you think it affects their mobility, their gait? Absolutely. Fall prevention is so important. You know, it's basically the word prevention. No one has to worry about it if you prevent it, but once it hits, you're already at a disadvantage if you're a little bit older. You're probably going to heal a little bit slower, maybe not as completely. And often, too often, depending on the injuries, it can actually lead to further debility and possibly eventually no longer being independent in terms of your ambulation. Older people are at extreme risk. If they fall, they need to let their doctors, their healthcare workers know. Okay, thank you. And then one more question. What are some of the other health conditions outside of diabetes that can lead to foot issues? Well, anything related to the nervous system. Again, as we kind of joked about it, the foot's connected all the way to your brain through a kind of a chain. So if you have a condition with any condition, especially with your low back, it could actually show up symptomatically in the foot. So one of the ones that is often difficult to kind of understand is called spinal stenosis, where you have kind of narrowing of the nerves as they kind of dangle below your spinal cord. They can get impinged. Now remember, this is way up in your back, but it's in your feet that you feel the burning. So that's why not every patient that comes in with nerve kind of problems, we do want to know if they're diabetic, but they're not always diabetic. They could be, could be I hate to say it, due to alcohol or maybe more commonly due to cancer chemotherapeutic agents. There's many a plethora of other problems that unfortunately will manifest themselves in the foot, not just diabetes. Thank you. Where can the audience find more resources on this topic? Well, I want to just kind of recommend two websites that I approve of, and that is my state organization, which is the Florida Podiatric Medical Association, and the acronym, of course, is FPMA. And if they add the .com, they can go to the website. There they can seek out a lot of, you know, appropriately, uh, let's say, peer-reviewed information for patients about many of these topics you brought up with me today they can find a podiatrist. If they're not in Florida, because I thought you'd be asking me that, then they can go to the national organization I'm a member of called the APMA, or the American Podiatric Medical Association. That one is APMA.org. Similar, to, you'll see it's similar to the state site, similar information, and again, you could find a podiatrist and great information as well. A lot of times, most of the elderly clients that come into the clinic They'll say, I can't find a podiatrist. I don't know where to find one. Where would you suggest outside of your recommended resources that you just mentioned? I think you need to, first of all, and we kind of mentioned this early on about what my healthcare brothers and sisters should be doing. In addition to knowing some basic things about feed and foot problems, they should also know what podiatrist they would recommend. They're not gonna recommend everybody. I trust my doctor. When I go to my primary doctor and he says, I don't need a podiatrist, but if he says, I need a urologist, whatever, he'll give me two or three choices, and I hope that they start there. If not, sometimes family and friends, and even that friend in the condo might be necessary. Mm -hmm. Podiatrists are kind of like other specialists. They tend to aggregate around major cities. Should be no problem in Broward County, Miami-Dade. You're in kind of more rural areas of this county. It could be a little bit more difficult to either access a podiatrist or to get in in a prompt way. Okay. And also they can search their insurance plan to see who, which podiatry is on the 
their specific plan too. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise with our audience. It's been a pleasure having this discussion with you. Please stay tuned for upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter expert. Dr. Jaffe, thank you so much for your time. Again, thank you for having me. It's very enjoyable.